Well, it's a really hard question. I actually gave two papers on it here at DesignCon this year, and there's not really an easy way. Um, last year, Heidi Barnes and I gave a paper on how to make measurements from a VRM and, uh, and board in order to determine what the dynamic current is. It's, it's a lot of work and it's not perfect. The best way probably is the designer's tools. Almost every designer provides a tool for calculating what the dynamic current is. Again, it's not perfect. And then the least accurate is just the, um, the rule of thumb that was provided by Larry Smith who invented target impedance and that is that you take the maximum operating load current and divide it by two, take the delta voltage allowed and divide it by the delta current allowed and that'll give you the target impedance. So that, that's a trick question, right? Designed from power integrity. So there's always this trade of this between the signal guys and the power guys. So added to the complexity is how many I.O. signals, how many data, data signals come out of the I.O. Because the chip is pretty big and most of the balls are allocated to signal channels. Of course, the signal integrity engineers want all of the board space to be allocated to them. And the power engineers, well, they're saying, no, 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 power is much more important than signal integrity. So we've got to make sure that we do the power part first. And so the signal guys and power guys actually duke it out to figure out who gets what space. Typically, the way that it works is that we allocate two sides to power and two sides to signal. That's getting a lot more difficult with bigger chips. In fact, I spoke to uh, two manufacturers here, and we have a couple of customers of our own that have more than a thousand amps going to a single A signal. So the printed circuit board is getting a lot more challenging from the power and tell you perspective, but it's always kind of a negotiated problem. Based on the design of the printed circuit board, we end up with a, an inductance in the power plane. And we have a lot of control over that. Thinner dielectrics, thinner layers mean lower inductance. But however it is we design this, we end up with some distance between the voltage regulators and the power chip and some thickness of the dielectric and that results in some inductance from the power planes. Then we have to determine the bulk capacitors from that inductance on the target impedance. And specifically, the bulk capacitance is equal to the plane inductance divided by target impedance squared. And that tells us a couple things. One is that we obviously don't want the impedance to be as low as possible because that makes the capacitors as big as possible to a second order. So that number is getting really big really fast. Um, so what we want to do is minimize the plane inductance and then we calculate the bulk capacitance from C is equal to the R squared. And we try to set the bulk capacitor ESR to be equal to the target impedance. Um, you don't actually select the decoupling capacitors any differently than you select the bulk capacitors. The ideal goal is to still have a flat impedance, and in order to do that, it means that capacitance is equal to inductance divided by resistance squared. And the resistance is target impedance, so presumably we know what the target impedance is, so we select the decoupling capacitors to be equal to the inductance divided by resistance squared. Now, where to put them, that's a whole different story. Um, so most simulators today have optimizers built in that will figure out where the ideal placement is. Um, but we do know about what the total capacitance is from that C is equal to L over R squared. So, so we kind of know what, what to do with that. If you get the package impedance, the, the actual characteristic impedance of the, the chip package, then you could set the target impedance to be equal to that, and then again set it C is equal to L over R squared. So, so very clearly everything is revolving around what the target impedance is and how much plane inductance we got. Interestingly, and maybe not coincidentally, but maybe it is, a, um, a power supply actually looks a lot like a print circuit board plane. It's inductive, and it's inductive because of the control loop. And so, in, in a very simplistic way, we can stabilize the power supply exactly the same way we control resonances in the board by setting the capacitance to be C equals L squared. So, if we can set the resistance of the 
the power plant to our target impedance. And we know what the inductance of our voltage regulator is, then we can select the appropriate capacitors. This is kind of tricky because we also had to pick bulk capacitors based on the board inductance. We needed to pick decoupling capacitors based on the board inductance. So a lot of the capacitors that we place aren't for the regulator, they're for the power distribution network. And at the same time, we're saying the stability of the power supply is a function of those capacitors. And so now we've got to solve two different equations at the same time. One is to get the right amount of capacitance for the board, and one is to make it match the voltage regulator so the voltage regulator is stable. And that gets a little bit tricky, but that's essentially how we do it. So, First, let's say that that loss is both a good thing and a bad thing. The loss means that in our high-speed signals, we're actually losing signal as we travel across the board. And we don't like that, right? That actually degrades the quality of the signal. But that absorption is also what's reducing the resonant cues of our printed circuit board. So in some ways, we actually like that absorption loss too. So kind of a balancing act. But we can reduce it in two ways. One way is to use lower loss materials. Uh, right, on, almost all of the dielectric manufacturers offer very low absorption materials for RF and microwave. But another tip is that if we can make the layers thinner and we make the traces narrower, we also end up with higher loss. And so conversely, making thicker dielectrics and wider traces reduces the loss. So we can do that also. If we go back far enough, why why did they invent S parameters? And I'm not even sure who invented them. I think it was Hewlett Packard um, in the late Jurassic era, uh, so, somewhere around there. So I don't actually know who did it. Um, but they were trying to make measurements, and they realized that no matter how they tried to make measurements, the probes were always in the way. They could never make probes that were good enough. They could never make probes that were high enough bandwidth. But they came up with this methodology that said, well, if we matched all signals to some impedance, so the signal generators, they're all 50 ohms, and we make coaxial cables that are 50 ohms. And so somebody realized, if we make all of our measurements with 50 ohm sources and 50 ohm terminators, then they perfectly match the cable, and our bandwidth become essentially unlimited. So we can make very high frequency measurements if we can match those uh, cables and instruments. And so if we do that, we end up with what we now call scatter parameters. And what that really means is we just connect these 50 ohm ports to all of our dots and, and we measure transmissions and reflections of everything connected to 50 ohms. Then we can transform that to impedance, which is what we really want most of the time. Um, but the reason we did the S parameters in the first place was just so we could get very high bandwidth measurements without probes being in the way. Um, sure. So, um, the Bode 100 analyzer is kind of unique. Um, I think there's probably only one other analyzer that has this feature, but it, it can do both vector network analysis of frequency response and also S parameters. And those are different. We said the S parameters mean that we're making 50 ohm measurements of transmissions and reflections. In frequency response analysis, we're doing something different. We use three ports, one to generate a signal, and then we use one to measure voltage, one to measure current, and we divide voltage over current, and that tells us impedance also. So the Bode 100 allows us to measure the excess inductance of power planes and the capacitance of power planes and, and even vias. It allows us to measure frequency response, which is power supply rejection ratio, control loop gain. Uh, we've even reconfigured that so that we can measure S parameters with the frequency response analyzer. On the S parameter side, we can use it for everything that we would use a vector network analyzer for. A lot of people use them for tuning antennas. So if you're one of those old timers that still has a CB radio, OD100 will help you tune your antenna. Um, now, I can't leave this out because the very first time I saw a Bode 100, I talked to the manufacturer about what they used them for, and they said they used them for measuring the ripeness of fruit. And I said, what? And they said, yes, yes, we use um, Bode 100s to measure impedance, and grocers use impedance to determine the ripeness of their fruit.
and health companies use Bode 100s to measure the impedance of blood plasma. And to be honest with you, the very first Bode 100 we sold was to the National Institute of Health, and I said, what are you going to measure with it? And they said, blood plasma. So what makes them superior is that they're, they're perfectly matched and they're set to uh, specific pitches that match the common pitches placed on the printed circuit So they're easy to use, they're fast to use because they're browser probes and they're high bandwidth. Oh, we're actually showing a few here at Tektronix that are a little early, they're not ready to be released yet. We do have a new um, set of adapters for oscilloscopes that allow us to measure two-port PDN impedance in an oscilloscope. And we're showing those off and we're also introducing the latest version of our differential time domain reflectometer in a USB stick, uh, 10 and a half gigahertz in a USB stick, so that's pretty cool also. We also have a couple of new probes coming this year and those are also at the Tektronix booth today. Wow, um, you know, I'd have to say wide band gap, followed probably by wide band gap, and that would probably be followed by wide band gap. So, um, you know, wide band gap has been coming for 10 years at least. Um, so the slowest moving tidal wave I think I've ever seen, right? Um, it, it's been coming for a long time, but it's finally here. And that's actually transforming the, the world of electronics in a big way. Analog and power engineers that are, you know, typically used to low speeds all of a sudden have power switches that are gigahertz switching. And now you put that onto a printed circuit board and all of a sudden ground bounce, VDD droop, and plane inductance, um, it takes on all new meanings. And we get to see things that I think I like to say we wish we didn't see. Um, because it's not always a pretty sight, but it does mean that we have to be much more careful about how we design printed circuit boards in order to uh, achieve wideband gap stability. And it also means that we become more sensitive to things like uh, semiconductor bond wires, for example. Those bond wire parasitic inductance just combined with the board at very high frequencies to resonate. And even the printed circuit board itself, it's very easy to, to, to destabilize a gallium nitride element just from a printed circuit board without adding anything else. There's some really great uh, videos about that. And one of the most fascinating is by one of my superheroes, Matt Ozalis in Keysight. And he did this, this analysis of a gallium nitride transistor and why it was unstable on a printed circuit board and how, um, how important it was to fix it. And he looked at the board and he simulated the board and he added a via. And so there you go, it's fixed. Um, and we said, what? <laughs> um, and it, he has this video. Um, it, it's the most incredible thing. And so I think that, you know, the takeaway from that is that we always thought, at least in the power world, that the printed circuit board was just there and it just makes these connections. We don't really have to worry about it. But now today, even power electronic engineers have to be really aware of the impact of the printed circuit board on their design and how to optimize their design through the printed circuit board. So the printed circuit board really is a very essential element and it's one that we really need to optimize. So I think gallium nitride and wide band gap in general are changing the world.